Bienvenidos and welcome to the webinar co-construction. Nica Ruiz Casares, I'm an associate professor of psychiatry at McGill University and coordinator of the Global Mental Health Research Seminar in the Faculty of Medicine. I will be moderating the webinar today. This webinar is an initiative of the Global Mental Health Program at McGill University in Montreal in collaboration with the Faculty of Public Health at Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia in Lima. It builds on a two-decade relationship between these two institutions and honors the memory of the late Dr. Duncan Peterson from the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry at McGill University, who was instrumental in nurturing this partnership. Dr. Ines Bustamante Chavez, the Vice Dean of the School of Public Health and Administration at Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia, will moderate the panel that will follow this webinar in Lima. And I will provide information on how to join remotely at the end of this session. We're delighted to be opening this relationship even wider by means of this bilingual webinar. And before I introduce our speaker, let me point out a couple of important features of this platform that will facilitate your participation. If you're joining us directly from your computer or the VoiceBoxer mobile app, notice that you can select your language of choice, English or Spanish, at the bottom of the screen. Also, your microphones are all muted, but you will be able to send questions for the speaker at any time using the general chat box underneath my image on the screen. You cannot, however, see the presenter or chat if you're connecting through a cell phone. Again, you may send your questions in English or in Spanish. Those of you who are following this webinar from the Auditorium Alberto Hurtado at Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia, please pass on your written questions to the organizers so that they can channel them to us. For any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact the Voice Boxer support team by clicking on the question mark icon on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Now let's move on. Um, to the, on the court uh, of, the, of this session. Our speaker today is Dr. Lawrence Kiermeyer. He is James McGill Professor of Psychiatry and Director of the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry and of the Global Mental Health Program at McGill University. He is the Editor-in-Chief of Transcultural Psychiatry, a Senior Investigator at the Lady Davis Institute, and Director of the Culture and Mental Health Research Unit at the Institute of Community and Family Psychiatry at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal, where he conducts research on culturally responsive mental health services, the mental health of indigenous peoples, and the anthropology of psychiatry. He directs a Canadian Institute of Health Research Pathways to Health Equity Suicide Prevention Implementation Research Team, he is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and the Royal Society of Canada. He is a very prolific writer and a presenter in high demand, and we're honored to have him with us today. Thank you, Lawrence, for accepting our invitation. I will pass the floor to you now. much, Monica. Uh, hello to all of you in, in uh, Peru and elsewhere in the world who are joining us. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to take part in this inaugural uh, webinar as part of our global mental health program. Uh, and as Monica mentioned, this has been done in collaboration with our colleagues in Peru and really carries forward the work uh, that our colleague Duncan Peterson uh, initiated over many years uh, in Peru and elsewhere in uh, Latin America. Uh, the topic for our discussion today is the process of producing knowledge uh, in the context of global mental health, that is doing the kind of research and the kind of um, exploration of issues that can meet uh, the challenge of improving equity in access and provision of mental health care uh, 
uh, and addressing basic needs in, in mental health around the globe. I framed the title as co-constructing. As you'll see in a few minutes, this has a lot to do with the ethics and politics and pragmatics of how we try to go forward uh, in doing work in global mental health. Um, let me uh, begin, though, by saying a few words about the context uh, that we work in. Uh, first of all, to acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, the institutional setting of this division of social and transcultural psychiatry, uh, which since the mid-1950s has been concerned with how to address issues of culture and cultural difference and cultural diversity in the provision of um, mental health services, but also in the development of psychiatric research uh, theory and practice. Can we take uh, the fact of human experience as uh, being culturally situated seriously and see how that really should inform our mental health practice. So that's the backdrop to what I'll be talking about uh, today, focused more explicitly on global mental health. Uh, we have a global mental health program at McGill that basically brings together people working in different parts of the world. This is a, an incomplete and not up-to-date map of some of the places where people have projects uh, that fall under this new umbrella of global mental health, which is a kind of rebranding, refocusing, perhaps reorientation of uh, international work that has been going on in one form or another for many years. Uh, and our discussion today will really have to do with what is the underlying philosophy of global mental health efforts, and particularly the movement for global mental health, and how can cultural considerations and structural considerations shape the work that goes on? And what are the implications of this in particular for the kinds of collaborations, the kinds of partnerships that we can have uh, uh, around the globe as we uh, address these common goals and concerns? So I'll s first talk a, few, a bit about some of the basic questions and tensions in global mental health, uh, and I'll relate that to issues of cultural and structural competence, that is, as ways that we can take culture and context, social context, into consideration seriously in our work. I'll touch on uh, some broader and fairly deep philosophical issues uh, about um, different epistemologies, different forms of knowledge and, and authority, and how those fit together in contexts of cultural uh, and healthcare pluralism, uh, which is the fact in most of our societies, but which poses serious challenges for efforts to provide uh, services and interventions that are evidence-based. Um, and then to focus most directly on the theme of my, my overall talk, I will um, describe some um, reflections and some frameworks for trying to create safe spaces for genuine knowledge exchange and co-production. That is to ways that we can try to work toward having uh, deeper, more grounded conversations that bring together very different perspectives to try to generate useful knowledge in global mental health. Uh, and finally, I'll try to draw out a few of the implications for global mental health research and practice. And these last issues in particular, I'll frame in the context of some work that we've been doing here in Canada with indigenous peoples. Uh, so these are a lot of things to talk about. I'm going to touch on things. I have a number of slides. I won't uh, necessarily mention everything on the slides. The slides will be available to you afterward. Uh, but I want to just follow a kind of thread through these, uh, these various issues to put some things on the table so we can have a bit of a discussion after my presentation. So the, the broad perspective that I want us to be able to consider in this discussion is that global mental health, both the fact of global health diversities and the needs that people have in different parts of the world, and the ways in which these issues are being reframed in the current context of globalization, exists against a historical backdrop of colonialism, of uh, neocolonialism in different forms, uh, and of top-down structures in which dominant economic and political institutions globally exert very strong influence on uh, where resources flow and what is considered good practice and how indeed the kind of knowledge economy that underwrites the professions plays out in different parts of the world. As part of forces of globalization, ways of talking and thinking about oneself in terms of psychology or even in terms of the vocabulary of psychiatry, the diagnostic vocabulary of psychiatry, have become 
uh, elements of a culture that have been exported around the world and that exert some force on modifying people's own notions of personhood uh, that already exist in different places. Psychiatric institutions themselves, because they are both involved with providing services and help, but also in some instances involved with providing certain kinds of social control, play a role in social regulation in different societies. So understanding how that plays out is very important uh, in the context of global mental health. For example, concerns about the use of confinement and restraints and coercive treatments globally have been one of the motivating factors for trying to improve the quality of care internationally. But that needs to be understood in terms of the local uses and the local uh, dilemmas that people face in trying to manage um, uh, challenging behavior and problems in small-scale settings and small communities with limited resources and so on. The specific effort to make a kind of movement for global mental health, to mobilize resources and to advance uh, 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 change in different healthcare systems, has involved a kind of repackaging and reconceptualizing of the central problems in particular ways. And I want to devote a few minutes to talking about uh, what those um, uh, those particular orientations are in the movement for global mental health so that we can both put them on the table and then open up a broader discussion about some of the goals and methods of uh, global mental health. Uh, and so this, this, these next few slides and the points I'm going to make come from this article uh, written with uh, uh, Duncan Peterson some years ago that uh, address some of these um, initial arguments and approaches that uh, laid the foundation for much of the recent activity in global mental health. So in that article, we make the point that the global mental health movement uh, made four key moves, and this is against the backdrop of a global health movement that managed to mobilize new resources to address infectious disease and other kinds of development issues, uh, but that also left a scenario in which mental health was being given low priority. And so the WHO and other organizations have worked to try to give mental health a higher priority. Uh, and the arguments mobilized by the global, men uh, movement, uh, global mental health movement uh, were part of this effort to highlight the importance of global mental health. So briefly, the first point was to try to document huge disparities in mental health in low and middle income countries. Uh, to argue that these should be a higher priority in development and not secondary to other public health measures, uh, as has typically been the case in, in uh, uh, previous uh, uh, periods. And then to frame that disparity and that gap in terms of a treatment gap, that is to suggest that some kind of provision of treatment, access to care, would go a long way toward uh, redressing these disparities. And then to uh, address that treatment gap through using various methods of task shifting uh, and task sharing so that um, uh, care providers with less professional uh, training and less um, um, uh, skills could be upskilled in order to provide basic care in different settings. And that would meet the, uh, the problem of finding an adequate number of, of care providers in many parts of the world. Uh, so that's the basic philosophy of global mental health movement. It has been nuanced and elaborated in various ways. Uh, but there are some challenges with those basic arguments. And again, briefly, the first is that our actual data on the prevalence of disorders around the world is not adequate. Uh, and it is complicated by the challenges of cross-cultural research. And that, of course, has been a major focus of our own work in Montreal over the years of trying to understand better uh, how to uh, measure and assess problems across cultures with adequate respect for the very different ways that people articulate suffering and uh, cope with it. The second set of issues have to do with the fact that uh, structural problems uh, uh, involving uh, uh, social adversity are major contributors to uh, mental health, to health in general, of course, and that if we focus only on services, we may be missing uh, uh, the, the fundamental sources of problems that are in the social determinants of health. Similarly, focusing on treatment gap privileges mental health services per se, uh, even in a, a, a watered down or simplified form that can be given by people with less training and less resources at their disposal in, uh, in diverse settings. Uh, and finally, the assumption that to guide that kind of delivery, uh, the existing evidence base in developed mainly in northern, western, urbanized uh, uh, societies is adequate uh, can also be called into question in terms of how well diversity is really being engaged with and whether, in fact, we need a larger and different um, uh, body of data. 
Some of these challenges, these have been posed uh, in, in the context of debates around global mental health. Uh, some of the prime movers and people involved with developing global mental health have responded to some of these. And so there has been some progress in this discussion uh, and some refinement of how people go about doing work. But there are persistent controversies. Uh, which really fall along much the same lines, but which also include uh, concern about whether we're really measuring uh, the, the right, uh, uh, deploying the right interventions, measuring the right outcomes or adequate range of outcomes, and whether in the process of trying to provide basic services, uh, we're also inadvertently undermining some existing forms of solidarity and support that might exist in communities. And this is not to imply that uh, everything always works fine in communities. There's no need for other resources. That's not the argument at all, uh, but to insist that understanding how existing resources do work and what their strengths are and what their potential is for integration or for collaboration with other services is vital to meeting the, the large uh, um, uh, scope of, of needs that exist in different communities. Finally, we can't frame the problems of inequities globally simply in terms of redistribution of resources. There's also a fundamental question of recognizing difference, of recognizing the fact that mental health is not a one-size-fits-all uh, domain, that we have to tailor-make our, both our assessments and our interventions uh, in ways that make them appropriate and meaningful and fit well uh, to local communities. If we don't, there's a, a risk that in our efforts to address these disparities, we will inadvertently displace attention from social, structural, and other problems that are more difficult to address. Uh, we will inadvertently be serving agendas of other, uh, other actors in the scene, notably uh, multinational pharmaceutical corporations who have a vested interest in uh, delivering their products to uh, as, as many populations as possible uh, and who um, uh, may bring with that uh, conflicts of interest in terms of what needs what will best meet the needs of local populations. Uh, I've already mentioned this dilemma of risking uh, ignoring or invalidating or displacing indigenous systems of mental health promotion and healing, some of which may be tied to uh, religious traditions, to other forms of uh, social connection and support, and indeed to the resilience of local communities. And on an overall level, and this speaks again to the main theme of the discussion today, um, we may, by uh, advocating kind of uh, top-down approaches, undermine the sense of local autonomy and self-direction that we believe are actually part of the sources of mental health and well-being uh, for communities uh, and uh, peoples. So this leads us to sort of suggest that there are some basic tensions uh, when you look at the issues of global mental health, some basic tensions in a variety of domains that need to be talked about in ways that are not uh, uh, destructive of the efforts that people are making, but that enrich them and inform them and allow us to look uh, honestly at some of the trade-offs that are involved in the efforts we're making. Some of those are about governance, who's in control and what forms of power are being deployed in the, uh, in the process of global mental health. Um, political economic issues uh, in terms of uh, what interests are driving the whole enterprise. Uh, epistemic issues, and I'll come back to this in a moment, in terms of what counts as knowledge and evidence, who has a say in what counts as a, uh, um, an evidence-based practice or a good practice to try to explore. Um, and then a broader domain, two broader domains really, I guess, of cultural ideological uh, questions about what values are at play in our discussions of mental health, to what extent are we promoting through different forms of therapy or different kinds of intervention or counseling and, or psychoeducation, to what extent are we promoting certain forms of personhood that themselves need to be open to discussion and may sometimes be at odds with some local values uh, for better or for worse, and we need to make that explicit. And that leads directly to the moral ethical questions that we need to look at how issues and options are being framed <clears throat> and what forms of rationing and of cost-benefit choices are being made in the delivery of uh, global mental health. <coughs> okay, hold on. Um, some of the issues we're talking about have been framed in the past, in, in recent years, uh, uh, in, under the rubric of structural competence. That is, if we want to address health disparities, whether within uh, high-income countries or in any setting, low-income, middle-income, any kind of geographic setting that we're looking at, uh, we need to consider social structural issues. These have particular histories. 
Uh, they uh, are tied to certain vested interests. They're sometimes partly invisible because of that connection to uh, local interests, and they differ around the globe. So finding ways to engage with uh, structural adversity and difference in particular parts of the world uh, is important and requires social theory and social analysis uh, for us to advance. The emphasis on structural uh, competence is sometimes set in opposition to cultural competence, but I think this is a mistake. Uh, because the social and the cultural are com entirely intertwined. Uh, and the social arrangements we have in any part of the world are um, put in place, rationalized, maintained by cultural values and perspectives that people have. So beginning to clarify even what the structural uh, adversities are and differences that exist and challenges that exist in a particular society uh, has to be done through awareness of cultural values and orientations. Moreover, the resources we have for helping and healing draw intensively from cultural meaning and uh, practices that are sources of identity and resilience and collaboration within communities. So uh, I think it's a false dichotomy. We really need to bring these together and not view them as opposition, but as different uh, vocabularies, different frameworks that draw attention to specific things. Uh, so culture in this context is very important for figuring out uh, issues of structural competence because it stays close to people's lived experience. It helps us see what is taken for granted in some ways because of cultural ideologies, and it allows us to challenge uh, some of the forms of practice within psychiatry that are presented as science uh, but in fact represent a bureaucratic culture or something even more uh, local and um, idiosyncratic. Another way that people have tried to approach the whole issue of addressing diversity in global mental health is through a focus on person-centered care. Uh, and the orientation here is really to look closely at individual experience and to be in open dialogue with patients and uh, communities with whom we're working and to take the lead from what we're doing from those conversations so that the voice of the stakeholder, of the, of the patient, of the client, of the community is central to any uh, kinds of ideas that are generated or approaches that are uh, developed to intervene. Uh, so then you can ask, is that sufficient? Do we need a notion of culture in our production of knowledge at all? Can we just say we're person-centered, so all the key people are around the table and they all have a say, and culture or whatever differences of point of view will, will work itself out? And here I want to argue again that an explicit reflection on cultural context, cultural history, local cultural values and practices is essential. For one reason, uh, for, for, uh, for one, because people do not have a complete knowledge or awareness of the cultures they themselves participate in. The whole point of culture is to make things work seamlessly and cooperatively among people so it resides to a very large extent in the taken for granted. And it's precisely in the process of thinking through in a more systematic way what are the cultural assumptions of our mental health program, of our nosology, of our interventions, that we begin to open the door to a deeper conversation, a deeper reflection on the cultural values and uh, resources available to us in trying to address mental health. So this brings us to what perhaps is the most challenging and uh, uh, fascinating aspect of this, which is the notion that there are, within different traditions, different uh, systems of knowledge, different ways of uh, learning about things, uh, validating them, of trusting different kinds of authority. And in some cases, these are not simply competing systems, but are central to people's identity as a community. And I'll illustrate this in a moment in talking about indigenous healing, because this has uh, become really central to discussions in Canada and uh, New Zealand, Australia, other places where indigenous people have brought forward the notion that they have their own knowledges, uh, that are rooted in certain ways of life and that need to be taken into consideration. So in recent years uh, in New Zealand, uh, in the concept of cultural safety, in Canada through the work of Uli Ermine and his discussions of ethical space, or uh, Albert Marshall, another First Nations elder, uh, two-eyed seeing, which is what this little, um, uh, little uh, icon represents, uh, the notion that we have in the encounter between evidence-based practice and psychiatry and engagement with uh, indigenous communities or indeed any community in any part of the world, we have more than one kind of knowledge being brought together. And rather than it simply being the, the sort of technocratic approach of psychiatry, international psychiatry will, will give us all the answers, uh, we see the need for a different kind of conversation, a different kind of engagement 
engagement with um, different bodies of knowledge, uh, and that needs to go on in a safe space in a way that allows people really to be heard and to articulate their perspectives and to really see uh, if we can put together the best of different perspectives to meet the needs uh, of different communities. So this is, I say, a complex set of issues. There are political issues, there are pragmatic issues, ethical issues, all of which need to be worked out, and there's no uh, overarching answer, but the key, I would say, insofar as we understand it from these uh, different um, indigenous elders uh, and, and the debate that's going on with scholars and so on, uh, is about creating the kind of safe space, the kind of social space, the kind of political space in which people can be fully heard and their perspectives articulated and the, the, um, the, uh, the value and the, um, the uh, potential that's inherent in different traditions can be brought forward and can be adequately supported at the same time as we try to bring things together. So let me just illustrate this but before closing with an example uh, that comes from our own work in Canada through our uh, network for Indigenous Mental Health Research, uh, and um, uh, which was a, a program set up to try to address the needs of Indigenous communities uh, first of all, by improving capacity, by training scholars, both indigenous and non-indigenous, to do research and, uh, in a way that better met the needs of communities and respected uh, ethics, uh, uh, the ethics of communities and uh, their own aspirations. What's driven this whole uh, concern in Canada, this effort, has been a growing awareness of the very sad history of cultural oppression, uh, what our own Truth and Reconciliation Commission concluded was, in effect, cultural genocide practiced by the Canadian government and its uh, institutions uh, against Indigenous people for uh, uh, over 100 years, <coughs> 50 years. This has led to a situation in which there are a set of interrelated health problems, social problems that communities are still grappling with that uh, uh, to a large extent have come from a process of forced cultural change, forced assimilation, and a structural disadvantage. And this diagram just represents some of the pathways of transmission of uh, adversity uh, in, uh, in this context. Um, and so it's against that backdrop uh, and a growing awareness of the way this has played out in mental health that we've been trying to develop collaborative, a collaborative process of developing interventions. And central to what I'm going to talk about is the, the role of the community in driving this process. And this is just a, a slide representing a bit of data that shows why that's so important. This is from a research project by Michael Chandler and Christopher Lalonde working with First Nations communities in British Columbia and Canada, and showing that those communities that had high levels of local control, that is, they had uh, some level of self-government, they were involved in land claims, they controlled their own education, they controlled their own health services, they controlled, they had cultural facilities, they controlled police and fire services, had almost no suicides uh, in over a five-year period. Whereas those communities that had none of these indicators, only one, had an astronomically high rate. So this is a powerful piece of evidence suggesting that the degree of local control, which uh, Chandler Lalonde framed as cultural continuity, but which involves continuity through adapting to new circumstances, to uh, taking on the kinds of institutions and community um, resources that are available in the, in the current context of the Canadian nation state and engaging with those, that those communities that successfully engage with those at a community level have associated with that uh, this huge improvement in uh, or reduction in suicide rate, also reduction in motor vehicle accidents, also improved um, outcomes in terms of youth getting uh, uh, through school. So uh, awareness of these issues, awareness of the history that I just described in terms of residential schools, which is a, a very recent phenomenon in Canada, has led to changes in how we work. Uh, and uh, has highlighted the notion of cultural safety, which came out of the work of Maori uh, uh, practitioners and scholars in, in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, and has now been incorporated into Canadian discussions. Uh, and so the project I'll just describe in the last uh, a few minutes, uh, we call Listening to One Another. It's culturally based, family-centered mental health promotion for Indigenous youth. The goal in this program is to take a generic program that there's some evidence um, uh, uh, for efficacy uh, and to set up a structure by, by which each community, each indigenous community or each uh, First Nation can develop their own culturally adapted version. So they're using a structure that comes from uh, work in mental health and education and so on that suggests here's some useful things that people can benefit from, young people in particular is targeted to 
um, uh, youth, 10 to 14 years old, and their, their uh, caretakers, parents. But that basic framework of common sense mental health, of mental health first aid, of, of a certain amount of mental health literacy, of coping skills, and so on, appropriate for youth, is blended together with or coupled with a process of um, cultural identification, cultural learning, uh, so that uh, the vehicle for learning all this is a strengthening of youth's own understanding of their cultural identity and indeed of, of uh, uh, similar awareness in their parents and in the community as a whole. All the resources for this are uh, available online. We're, uh, um, as we're, we're nearing the end of this project, we're setting up a, a website in a context where people who are interested in using these materials will have full access to them. And what a community gets is a kind of template based on earlier versions from one community, which they can then uh, use, uh, go through a very systematic process of cultural adaptation, uh, borrowing from or building on their own local knowledge. Uh, so by bringing elders and other knowledge holders and stakeholders together in a, a steering committee, an advisory group, and then a cultural adaptation work group, they can thoroughly transform this intervention, remaining true to the overarching goals in terms of improving the well-being and health of uh, youth and their families, uh, but uh, devising ways, language and, and, and exercises and ways of doing this that really fully engage with local knowledge and local understanding. So this is part of what I'm getting at here at the community level when we talk about co-constructing knowledge because what's being produced in this process is something new and we can then evaluate it with the community and learn something new about what works for this kind of community. Uh, it's also being done at the level of regions and it can be done then collaboratively among regions so that knowledge sharing then occurs not from the top down from academics doing research in, in university centers or national centers of mental health, but from communities within communities or within regions and can then be shared across different communities and across different regions. Um, here's an example of one of the materials produced by the Anishinaabe communities working with this program, a board game that's used in uh, several points in the program uh, in different ways to do some of the um, the uh, advance some of the goals of sharing knowledge and, and promoting discussion among the youth and their families, and it's something they can do at home as well. So if we, if we uh, look at what's working, what may be helpful in this program, uh, we're valuing First Nations culture, history, and community, so we're beginning with an, uh, an open and strong acknowledgement that there is local knowledge, that there's local uh, perspectives that have to be the one of the, the, the groundings, one of the very basis of what we're doing in mental health promotion. Uh, within that, we're then helping youth and their families to learn improved coping skills and modes of communication and positive events, where, uh, po positive ways of being together. We're also reaching out across the generations and, and uh, strengthening the connection with elders who traditionally played a, a vital role as knowledge holders and transmitters of culture in their communities and in the process by bringing families together, strengthening a sense of community. <clears throat> so if we ask what are the implications of this for global mental health in general, I think we need to think seriously about whether the whole process of producing knowledge and evidence can be reconfigured to better fit with local uh, communities needs and aspirations so that even the process of doing research or even the process of beginning to implement a program itself is already a positive intervention. We think in the case of our program that cultural adaptation itself is an intervention already for the community and has positive effects. Uh, if we're going to do that work, we're going to have to be alert to the fact that we're doing it in a larger global context. There are pressures on us in terms of uh, what does it take to get some resources, to get a grant, what language do we have to speak, uh, how do we have to frame the process and the outcomes, and is that co consistent with or potentially at odds with some of the more local goals that we have, and can we watch that process over time and see how it's being modified and affecting the work that we're doing. So finally, that leads to a series of questions that I think we need to be engaging in in global mental health, not only about the immediate and uh, urgent effort to provide services and provide uh, resources to help people to deal with their very um, everyday mental health needs, but a larger set of questions that are questions for social science, uh, for political science, for uh, policymakers, to really reflect on the context we're working in and to ensure that we're able to respond in an adequate way, in a way of true partnership and engagement with uh, the populations uh, that we're working with. So this involves a, a larger perspective on psychiatry that we've tried to advance in other writing. Uh, and uh, I'm going to stop here and turn this back to Monica uh, so that we hopefully have some time for discussion and questions with uh, all of you.
Thank you, Lawrence, for a very rich presentation. We've been, we received some questions, and in the time we have left, we will now go through some of them. We might not be able to go through all of them, but you still have questions, please send them through the chat. Um, so I'll be asking each question and then turning the floor back to you uh, after I formulate each one. So um, regarding the structural competence, can structural competence be materialized and practiced as clinical skills? How and to what extent does structural competence change the mental health services provided by clinicians? Um, there has been a, a real effort in the last uh, five or six years to try to develop the idea of structural competence. I showed a slide with uh, some of the work of um, uh, Jonathan Metzel and Helena Hansen. Uh, there's a recent issue of uh, JAMA Psychiatry that has uh, um, some um, uh, viewpoints on the issue of, uh, of uh, structural competence, and we wrote a brief piece on the importance of advocacy. I mean, that's an obvious issue in structural competence that one thing we would try to do if you're assessing a problem that you see as having to do with larger structures in society, then uh, you're... Um, uh, obligated to try to address those in some way at a policy level and through advocacy for, for vulnerable groups. But the question really is, how does this play out at the level of the individual practitioner or uh, intervention programs and, and services? And I think that the first way and, and what was intended with the individual formulation of structural competence is that it, it leads to a different way of formulating health problems. Uh, that it insists that you properly contextualize them. And we do all do this anyway to some degree, and I think there's a strong tradition in Peru and other uh, uh, Latin American countries of kind of social medicine that has required that uh, clinicians think seriously about uh, the forms of structural adversity and disempowerment and so on that are central to people's uh, predicaments. When you're assessing a patient, you're not only making, in mental health, you're not only trying to make a formal diagnosis insofar as that might be useful to have sort of a differential uh, therapeutics and, and so on, but also generating a problem list, in effect. What are the predicaments this person faces? Uh, and some of those are manageable issues. Some of those may be very difficult issues to deal with on an individual basis, but they still need to be confronted and acknowledged when we're formulating the case. As the, those problems recur in any clinical setting, hopefully people can work together to begin to create alternate resources. So problems of poverty, problems of unemployment, problems of domestic violence, uh, problems of uh, collective uh, disempowerment, all of these can uh, be addressed both individually in terms of helping people to mobilize their own agency uh, and also ultimately through programs that create new opportunities for people locally. And I think clinicians, even clinicians working just one-to-one -one with communities, uh, uh, have a role to play in, in helping to develop and promote those and inform those and then direct people toward those services. Those of us who are also involved in public health interventions obviously are thinking a little bit on other levels in terms of things that can be done uh, collectively by directing resources toward uh, developing those kinds of programs and, and institutions and practices. So I, I'll uh, turn it back to you, Monica, for the next question. Thank you, Lawrence. Given that the global mental health movement aims to reduce the gap treatment, how could a community perspective of mental health care services promote access to health care? So the, the global mental health movement has identified this gap in access to care uh, as a, a major problem. Uh, and in most cases, it has to do, uh, looked at sort of the first pass is just to say, uh, there are very few mental health practitioners, certainly very few psychiatrists, very few psychologists, very few professionals of other kinds. Uh, so if, you're, if your notion of what a mental health service is, is that somebody's going to be directed toward a highly uh, specialized mental health practitioner, uh, that is um, very difficult to achieve in most parts of the world and arguably may never be achieved in, in quite the way it is in certain urban centers where there's so many people who choose to congregate there. Um, so uh, one idea is to try to uh, do uh, task shifting and sharing so that people whose primary focus may not be mental health, who are involved in obstetrical care or uh, community nursing or community activism or a whole host of other forms of engagement, could also have some additional skills in, in helping people to get basic care. 
uh, and I think this is a really worthwhile goal. One dilemma, though, is that a lot of mental health interventions are involve a fair bit of skill, and if people are being asked to do things with minimal training, uh, the quality of what they may be able to deliver may be limited, and there's a temptation through the whole thing to default to what may be simplest, which may be to write a prescription for someone or to just get a pill to someone. And this has been one of the concerns and one of the critiques of how uh, global mental health actually plays out when it gets uh, on the ground, that sometimes very uh, broader, integrative, very balanced uh, uh, models that people have of what they would hope to be delivering get simplified and, and stripped down because of all the practicalities. Looking at it from the other side, uh, one of the reasons, even when resources are available, that people don't make use of them is because they don't frame their problems as mental health problems. They understand them as personal problems, family problems, uh, moral, spiritual problems. So there definitely is a role for clarifying and helping people to understand those aspects of their difficulties that can be brought to a healthcare setting or to a social service setting and where they can get real uh, benefit from interventions there. In so doing, though, we should be looking, I think, critically again at the process and not assuming that uh, existing uh, psychotherapies or psychosocial care, whatever, are always optimal or the best fit for different kinds of troubles that people face in different parts of the world. It's possible that people have other solutions in some instances for certain types of problems uh, and that it's more of an issue of how to connect them to those resources and how to make appropriate use of them when they're facing uh, issues. Even where um, conventional psychiatry in terms of medication or in terms of uh, psychoeducation or something like this would be very helpful uh, to have maximum benefit it needs to work in concert with local processes that will maximize people's social integration maintain their social identity combat stigma and so on otherwise there's a risk that in the process of exporting our care we also export new forms of social identity that are uh, not always helpful for people that you know turn them into um, uh, people who are labeled or ostracized because of their contacts with uh, conventional mental health care. So I, that's a, a first pass on that question, Monica, which is a large question, like all of them. Thank you, Lawrence. How can you describe the relation between these two approaches, evidence-based medicine and medicine centered in the person? Are they expected to complement or to go in parallel? that these things would complement each other. We don't want to put aside any form of knowledge uh, that could be useful to people. Indeed, that's the way I think this whole debate has to go forward in the spirit of, of looking at the, the complementarity. The, there are tensions. It's not like everything works, and, and sometimes there are real contradictions and, and pushback, and we need to take that seriously too. But certainly nothing should be ruled out uh, uh, grosso modo, and no perspective by itself is, is sufficient. Uh, but... Uh, two interventions that have occurred within this sort of context of person-centered medicine are very important for our discussions. Uh, one is to insist that for every aspect of pathology or problems or deficits that we look at, we also look at the other side of resources and strengths. And of course, for interveners, for clinicians, if you're not just involved with making diagnosis, that's always a major concern. It's one thing to characterize the problems, you're also trying to characterize uh, what have we got to work with? What has this person got to work with? What can we capitalize on to help them do better? So having a systematic framework, which we do not get from existing psychiatric nosology, uh, for characterizing the strength and resilience and resources people have at individual, family, community levels, and so on, is vital to a person-centered and a people-centered care. Uh, the second issue that I think is very important is the notion, and it comes back to the theme of this talk, this notion of co-construction, that uh, if, if you're truly person-centered in your clinical approach, you understand what you're doing as something that is fundamentally dialogical, that is a negotiation between healthcare providers or planners or resource people with certain knowledge and people who need to make use of that, but need to make use of that in the context of what they already know and what they need. So it has to be a two-way street. So that's a shift in power. It's a shift in the way that the work goes. Uh, and whether it's research or planning or, or service delivery. And I think that's uh, a lot of what the person-centered approach stands for. It doesn't mean that we cannot come and say we've got the latest tools from 
uh, you know, from precision psychiatry, we, we, we can uh, assess people. We're not there yet, but eventually we may be where we can assess certain features of people and say, okay, I think this type of medicine might work better for you. Uh, we want to have that expertise to offer people. But the fundamental notion that it's not that technocratic expertise that drives the clinical encounter, but a, 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 a dialogical process with a, the person who is the sufferer and their community, their entourage, their family, and so on, the fundamental ethical and pragmatic notion that that's where we begin and end is central, I think, to person-centered uh, medicine. There's a book out on person-centered psychiatry, I think I alluded to one chapter, in, and it gives you this kind of framework to, to look at. There is a Latin American version of nosology that tries to build on that to, to present a, a more comprehensive framework for assessment in clinical care that I think should be part of the toolkit in, in global mental health efforts. Back to you, Monica. Thank you, Lawrence. Expecting doctors to address structural problems may increase physicians' burnout, which has been increasing lately. Could you please comment on that? That the first reaction of most clinicians when faced with structural problems is to feel, like all of us, I guess, to feel kind of overwhelmed and uh, challenged and also feel like we don't necessarily have the tools even to do this. So I think part of the key to this is... Um, at the level of assessment, it's certainly something that clinicians can do. We need to be aware of this, and it'll protect us from burnout because we'll understand what we're up against. We won't be unrealistic in our expectations of what a patient can or can't do, and we work within the framework of what we have. In terms of actually changing, in terms of addressing structural adversities and trying to change them, it's not something we can do alone as physicians. It's something that has to be done in collaboration with communities. But to the extent that we're able to do that, that we're able to form partnerships with groups within communities, with um, people at different levels in policy and practice and, and political systems, we can draw energy from that process because then we become part of um, a group that is really moving toward change. And I think that can be enlivening. And those clinicians who make that part of their, uh, their practice or an aspect of their life in some domain, you can't, again, take on everything. But if you have certain issues that you're ready to work with others to address, that can actually be a source of, um, of encouragement, of solidarity, and even of d identifying resources for some of your, your patients and the people that you're working with. So even though I think there's no question this is very, you're looking at the sort of the toughest issues uh, uh, that we all face right now, and we're at a time for, on a global level for various political and economic reasons where there's a lot of retrenchment going on and a lot of uh, people stepping back from human rights issues and uh, basic issues of equity that they should be, uh, should be front and center. Uh, so those of us who see the, the effects of this kind of um, uh, disrespect for, for uh, human beings uh, can really join with others, I think, in, in uh, collective advocacy in ways that then become rewarding for us and not just uh, feeling like we're, we're uh, struggling with a, a giant that we can't really tackle. Uh, back to you, Monica. Thank you again, Lawrence. In Colombia, we have a big problem. The biomedical model implemented by the health system does not allow to recognize the relevance of global mental health. What to do? So this is a, a general issue in psychiatry globally that we've had several decades now of a progressive biologization of psychiatry, partly because of the hope that it would allow mental health to be taken more seriously, because if we say, well, look, these are really brain disorders, so they're serious brain disorders, they should be treated like any other neurological problem. Uh, the problem is that our general level of care is challenging in other areas of medicine, too, insofar as we don't look at social context in assessment and treatment. So I'm not sure we want to go all the way down that path, even though there's no question that the biological dimension is pertinent to our understanding of uh, every health problem. Uh, I, I, in the slides that I showed, I, I went quickly past a slide called What Kind of Science for Psychiatry? And this is a, a, a more philosophical piece talking about the dilemmas of this framing of psychiatry and of mental health as being primarily about biology and with the idea that if we just do enough brain research, we'll have all the answers. I think we have to push back against that on many levels uh, to argue that human problems are also 
uh, um, uh, social, psychological, personal, spiritual. They have these many different dimensions, and we need those different vocabularies to make sense of them. First of all, just to understand what people are telling us about what's troubling them, but also to be able to uh, advise and implement appropriate interventions at whatever level. That I think we can make a strong case for that, and that paper is one small piece of that kind of argument. Uh, there's another aspect to the point that the question raised, which is that uh, mental health itself is often viewed just as a, a poor sister to other disorders and a low priority. And that's one area where the global mental health movement has been making uh, important strides in trying to document the social and economic impact of mental health problems to argue that aside from the evident suffering, and no one can look away from something like a severe chronic mental illness and people living in in uh, uh, terrible circumstances or uh, problems like suicide, no one can look away from those problems and not, you know, n not not accept that those are important health priorities. Uh, but even some of the more common and seemingly less severe problems have a cumulative toll on people's functioning, on their families, on the well-being of their children and the next generation that warrants giving them a lot more attention in how we think about uh, our, our intervention programs. So I think um, in terms of how to change or get government and get policy to address this, uh, you need to marshal your resources. More and more of these uh, arguments and examples in other countries are available to make the argument. You need to look for champions within the healthcare system, within the government, uh, who can work with you then to bring these things forward and to show how there are some interventions that can be made, cost-effective things that will begin to address these things in basic care for people. Uh, part of the key also is making this in intrinsic to general health care. That is, mental health care is not something separate. It's just a big chunk of general health care. Uh, perhaps the single biggest chunk in many contexts, and there has to be ways to provide it in a general health care setting. Uh, that's what has been done in Jamaica and other places where people have tried to integrate uh, care for a severe mental illness in primary care, in basic care delivery. So it's not a separate thing. It's within the skills of all the people involved all the time, and it's certainly within their responsibility and mandate. Over to you, Monica. Thank you, Lawrence. How can Brazil contribute to advancing global mental health? A question to present to me. I mean, I think people in Brazil need to get together and talk about that. I will say that in Brazil, as in other places, as in other countries, including Peru and other places, there has been a strong tradition of social medicine. There's a lot of thought that has gone into the way in which social context affects things. Uh, and you, that's something that can be built on and is being built on by people in Brazil already. Uh, there are a number of people from Brazil have been, um, over the years, have been visiting us here in Montreal and engaging with some of the tools of cultural psychiatry, and I think those need to be brought together with global mental health. Um, um, there's been work to try to use that in the context of training um, uh, uh, medical students and training residents so that they can adopt a more person-centered approach in their assessment of patients. And I think this speaks to the previous question as well, the notion that to the extent that we're developing models of training and models of practice that put together a person-centered approach, not only in mental health care but across the board, the more likely we are to be able to actually begin to address mental health issues in a more adequate way with our existing resources. Uh, so to go beyond that, I think that there are many specificities specificities to the Brazilian context uh, and things that are already been done in Brazil that can be um, uh, shared elsewhere. I think that sharing across different regions where people find parallels, similarities in the situation of indigenous people or people living in extreme poverty or other kinds of forms of disenfranchisement uh, <clears throat> provide a, a useful way to begin to mediate the existing models that are available and deciding which aspects do or don't fit the local context and what new approaches need to be generated out of the local context. So I think building this kind of lateral uh, knowledge exchange and so on could be very helpful uh, uh, globally. Uh, but again, Brazil's a huge place and it has many specificities. I will say that I think indigenous uh, health in Brazil has not gotten the level of attention and engagement that it really needs. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're obviously, uh, for all these things, or any area when I talk about, there are political reasons why certain things come forward at a certain moment in time and why other things may lag behind. And I think we all need to be aware of that and, and speaking out about it whenever we have an opportunity. Okay. What strategies could we use to cope with institutional barriers in the academy to include these approaches in mental health? 
I, I think there's several strategies. I've mentioned already the general strategy of looking for champions. So in, in many systems, there's, there may be a few people who are very simpatico and who understand uh, what you're concerned about, and you can sort of join force with them, and they can be advocates for, for this work. Um, and then I think there, there are several avenues of appeal through this work. Certainly the person-centered argument is a strong one to make because it has to do with quality of services, it has to do with basic ethical issues, and it means because it's engaging with the voice of the, of the patient, of the, 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 um, uh, the person, uh, the service uh, user and so on, it gives a certain kind of moral authority uh, to the argument. So it's not just that one is arguing because I'm interested in this area of work or this is the specialized thing that we do, give us more resources, give us more time. It's saying, look, these people who are our constituency as healthcare providers, these are their needs, this is what they're asking for, and here's a way to address it. So that person-centered approach, I think, is one avenue to push forward all of this work. Um, the human rights angle is another key angle in terms of, again, putting a certain kind of moral pressure and a certain kind of uh, logic and a certain kind of precedent to people to saying this is what's been done, this is what could be done in other parts of the world to address what are manifestly human rights abuses in terms of how people are living in a certain place. And then I will mention this other angle which I think in academic settings is important which is to acknowledge is that this is not only about giving back to the community and being a responsible citizen and, and improving the well-being of one's country as a whole or, and the disadvantage within any region, there also are a very interesting set of scientific questions about how uh, the nature of mental health problems, the nature of solutions. The fact that social determinants of health are among the most powerful determinants of health is extraordinarily important, and it certainly holds keys to understanding the nature of mental health problems. So it is also possible to frame some of these questions as intensely interesting and important scientific and research questions, and that can attract research dollars, uh, that can lend a certain academic and intellectual legitimacy to the whole enterprise that I think can be complementary with the more fundamental arguments which I've already mentioned that have to do with the person-centered approach and the, um, the, the ethics and, and, and uh, morality of that and the human rights issues that, that are overriding in this whole area. Uh, quickly, how to advance the global mental health agenda? What steps should be taken? Big question for a minute, but I'll give it back to you. If I'm back here, I'll try to go back to my slide. I think I actually had a slide that said something like that, so maybe that will help me to mention a couple of things. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this is my little list here of things that we could do. It's my own pet list. I think there are other things we could say. The first is that we need models of health problems that are mental health that are not just focused on the brain, that are multi-level, that are eco-social, that acknowledge that we're social beings, and that we develop all of that. We develop that theory. We develop modes of practice that go with that. That would then lead us to having a, a, a vigorous body of research, we need to have an, a critical mass where it's safe to have critique. Uh, we, you know, there's been, at the early years of the global mental health movement, there's been a sense of fragility that people were struggling hard to make arguments to mobilize resources, and therefore there was uh, anxiety and, uh, and distress about critiques that were brought forward. I tried to present the critiques here as uh, constructive critiques that force us to think hard about what we're doing and to, uh, to be more inclusive and more alert. Uh, that means, in fact, that we have to look at things like power differentials. Why are certain priorities being chosen? Can we, are those wise? Can we challenge those on some basis if there's a problem there? Uh, we need to um, develop a, a broader range of approaches, and that means having models of pluralism, when pluralism works. When do we need therapeutic pluralism, that we have many different things to offer people because different people are going to follow different paths? That also means we're hopefully able to maximize the resources we have available. And then the goal is to use this whole approach as a basis for developing equitable, par equitable partnerships for governance and development. We have a lot of top-down structures. We have a lot of wealthy institutions in certain places in the world, and they get to sort of call the shots to some degree. We need to find ways for them to work in closer partnerships so that power is genuinely shared. I mean, in a small way, this conversation we're having today hopefully spur, spurs many other conversations and good things can come from this. And certainly what we're interested in McGill is being part of those conversations, doing our own small part 
uh, to help create spaces where these discussions can go forward. But much like the question about what can Brazil contribute, it really has to come from uh, the global south. It has to come from those countries uh, where people are really energized to begin to address uh, the problems that they face locally and to work in, in partnership with others to mobilize resources and approaches to, to, to work creatively on all of this. And I think we're at the end of our time. We are at the end. I want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, it's been a pleasure. To t it's been uh, I, uh, I know we can't answer all the questions, but we'll try to find some way to continue this discussion with all of you. We cannot answer all the questions. Um, I'll pass to the end because we need to wrap up. And um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this, at the end of this webinar, there will be a panel of distinguished mental health professionals at Auditorium Alberto Hurtado at Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia. And if you are in Lima, you are welcome to join um, in person. Or if not, uh, we are going to be providing the link uh, to the, to the um, uh, platform where you can join. We'll also be distributing a, an evaluation via email um, for those of you who registered online or by paper, those of you who are in, uh, on site. And the recording of the webinar, both in English and in Spanish, will soon be posted in the websites of the McGill Global Mental Health Program and the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you to all who participated. I wish you all a good end of the day. And uh, we will just write down the, the connecting um, link here. Thank you, everyone.